Hello everyone, welcome to our final session for our SBR PTP sessions for the September exam. Very, very good afternoon to you, good evening to you, good morning to you, wherever uh, you may be uh, listening from. I'm back in the studio, of course. Ali says hello, hello to you, Ali. Everybody, please, that's uh, in here at the moment, can you just again give me the usual uh, signal as to whether the sound is coming through to you okay? Are we okay with the sound? Is everything okay? Just give us a quick nod. Whether we're okay with that, that's very good. Thanks for, thanks for that, everyone. We've got some uh, good. Letitia said it's good. Thank you very much indeed. Brilliant, everyone. So it's good to have, I can see some now familiar names coming through, which is really, really good. So here we are, um, Friday, certainly for me, it's Friday uh, afternoon, 1.30 in the afternoon. I'm just gonna very, very quickly um, put up, here's my Facebook page. We've had a couple of good questions coming in here. And again, I would just recommend you have a, keep looking at that. And just to let you know that the um, the file, the video from yesterday is up. So the first three days are now up. And here is the ACCA website. Um, we're gonna have a little look at some, some of the links here later on, which I need to encourage you to, um, to look at. Um, Rosalind says it sounds fine. Thank you very much. Let's go back to the launcher. And I am going to get us into our page where we were uh, yesterday, uh, pretty promptly, to be honest. But actually, I'm not, because I want to ask you um, all a couple of questions before we uh, before we start. And the first question is this: If I was to ask you for a definition of goodwill, would you? I don't need you to tell me the definition, but would you be able to give me a definition? If I asked you to define for me what goodwill is, would you be able to give me some sort of definition? What do you think? Yes or no? And we got some yeses coming in. Brilliant. Got some good yeses coming in. Right. And would you be thinking of, well, something along the lines of goodwill is the difference between the fair value of the consideration and the fair value of the identifiable net assets would would that sort of make sense with with what we've talked about so far i think uh, the general response there seems to be yes brilliant now let me ask you this please if i was to ask you what is the principle behind the goodwill calculation and i've mentioned the word principles before and it's one of the things that the examiner is very very keen uh, that we get across in our uh, narrative, that we understand the principles. And um, another word for principle is maybe, if you like, um, objective, if you like, so or reason. So um, let's just think about this, please. Let's just think about this. What um, if I asked you for the principle behind the goodwill calculation? What it, what is it? I know we talked about it yesterday. Would you be happy to come up with a principle? Would you be happy to come up with a, a description of a, a principle? What do you think? What do you think? If I said to you the principle was to compare the real value of what the acquirer is prepared to pay the objective is to compare the real value of what the acquirer is prepared to pay compared to the real value of what the acquirer has acquired. Does that make some sort of sense? Does that does that make some sort of sense? Yeah. So I think you're saying yes here. OK, right. So we know the, the definition is basically coming from IFRS 3. And the principle, the goodwill is the difference between the fair value of the consideration, the fair value, the identifiable net assets. And the principle is to compare, is to compare the real value of what the prepare, the, what the acquirer is prepared to pay to gain control compared to the real value of what actually is being acquired. And therefore, we arrive at some sort of difference, which we know is goodwill. Then that is basically coming up with uh, some sort of explanation as to the reason why we are doing this. So let me ask you this, please. Let me ask you this. Um, if I said to you the words or the numbers IAS 37, what would, what would come into your mind? IAS 37, IAS 37. Let's tell me, what do you think about this, please? IAS 37. Ali is saying provisions, Prasanath, Prasanath is saying provisions, 
Uh, brilliant. Fajardo is saying provisions, contingent liabilities and contingent assets. Very, very good. So IS 37 is, of course, provisions, contingent liabilities and contingent assets. Now, can I ask you, if I was going to ask you to define a provision in the same way that I've just asked you to define goodwill, would you be able to do that? If I asked you, I don't need you to write it down for me, but if I said to you, can you define what a provision is, would you be able to come up with a definition? Would you be able to come up with a definition? What do you think? Crystal says yes. Now, OK, Mohammed is writing it down for me. Mohammed is saying a provision is a liability of an uncertain timing or amount. Now, let's think about this, please. So a provision. In accordance with uh, IS 37, a provision is a liability of an uncertain amount or timing. Do you agree with that? That's what Mohammed is saying. Do you agree with that? Do you agree with that? Right. So this is straight away. Fantastic, everyone. You're giving me your input again here. You're interacting fantastically. Yes, uh, a provision is a liability of an uncertain amount or timing. Tell me this, please. What is the difference between a provision and a trade payable? If you had to sum up the difference between a provision and a trade payable, how would you how would you determine the difference? What's what's the basic difference between a, a provision and a trade payable? Maybe one word could sum it up, please, for us. One word. Tasneen says payable. A payable is a certain amount. Yes. Yes. Any anybody else coming up with that word? Now, remember, look, let's just go back. You've said to me that a provision is a liability of an uncertain amount or timing, an uncertain timing or amount. And you can see that there is a difference between a provision, let's say a provision for, I don't know, environmental damage compared to a trade payable. And it is to do with this word. It is to do with this word certainty or uncertainty. So remember that with a provision, there is, of course, a degree of uncertainty in terms of when it will be settled and how much it will take to settle it. So going back to my going back to my original uh, questions to you, which were and I don't need your answers, here, everybody, which for the first question was, could you come up with a definition of goodwill? And I think you said yes. And then I asked you, could you come up with a, a, the principle behind the recognition of goodwill? Could you come up with a reason? Could you come up with the objective for the recognition of goodwill? And, and you basically said yes. Now, taking that further forward, I'm now asking you, can you come up for me? Can you give me a definition of a provision? And you've basically said yes. Now, what I want you now to do is if I if I say this, can I? Would you be able to give me the principle? behind the recognition of a provision? Can you give me the objective behind the recognition of a provision? Can you give me the rationale, if you like, the reason? Anybody, what do you think? What do you think? If I said you don't necessarily need to write it down, but would you be able to give me the principle behind the recognition of a provision? What do you think? What do you think? Could you come up with a, a a rationale? Could you come up with a, a reason? And you, some of you are saying yes. And yes. And if I said this to you, the principle behind the recognition of a provision is to ensure that the entity recognizes only genuine obligations that it has, but it does recognize at the earliest point that obligation when it arises, even if there's there is a degree of uncertainty with respect to the settlement of that obligation. Let me let me go through that again. The principle is to ensure that the entity only recognizes genuine obligations. But where a genuine obligation does exist, then the entity must recognize that at the point that the obligation is created, even if there is a degree of uncertainty with respect to the settlement of that obligation does that does that ring true does that does that sound reasonable to you does that sort of make some sort of sense to everybody what i've just been saying there what do you think what do you think so i'm saying the principle is to ensure that only genuine obligations genuine liabilities are recognized but where there is this genuine obligation something that is genuinely unavoidable, 
then the entity has a requirement to recognize that at the point that the obligation is created, even if there is a degree of uncertainty with respect to the settlement of that. And some of you are now saying yes. Now, okay, let's take this one step further forward, please. Let's take this one step further forward. And I say this to you, are there any criteria within IS 37 to determine whether or not a provision shall be recognized? What's the answer to that, everybody? Are there any recognition criteria for a provision? Bicky is saying yes, Prasanth is saying three, Amna is saying yes. Yes, so is it? are there three criteria? Are there three criteria? Yes, there are. And how many of those criteria need to be met in order to recognize a provision? Let me ask you that. Fajana is saying all of them. Crystal is saying all of them. Abdullah is saying all of them. Right. OK. Prasant, all question mark. Yes. So hold on a minute. Isn't it that the, the criteria, the criteria within the standard are there to ensure that that principle is being applied with, i.e., there must be a present obligation as a result of a past event. There must be a probable outflow of economic benefit required to settle the obligation. There must be a reliable measurement of that obligation, because it's only if those criteria are met that we know that we're meeting the principle of the standard, which is to ensure that we have a genuine obligation and we must recognize that even though there is a degree of uncertainty. Does that make some sort of sense to you all, every, everybody? Just let me know. Does that sort of make some sense? And the reason why I am bringing this up now is because a few of you have asked me to give you an understanding, give you an idea of, of how to approach um, the narrative questions. Now, I want you to think about this, please. I really, really, for me, it's very, very, very important that we get a, a handle on this, get an understanding of this. One of the things I've said to you as we looked at maybe it was Scramble, and here is Scramble up, up on the screen now. We had a look at some points of look at some points to do with um, Kate. Let me come back to Jocka, which we're going to look at. Now, I said to you that it is very, very important that when you are doing your narrative, you, when you're doing your discussion, that you must you must demonstrate that you have a knowledge bank. You must demonstrate knowledge, but knowledge on its own is not sufficient. You've then got to apply that knowledge to the scenario. So if we go back to Kate, basically came up with a, a definition for a defined contribution scheme. We said that a defined benefit scheme is basically any other scheme. We said that the principle here is to ensure that the obligation is recognized as the employee provides service to the entity. And then we gave a, a clarity, we gave an understanding, we gave a description as to why this scheme of Kate was a DB scheme rather than a, a DC scheme. And what we did did as a result of to come up with uh, some knowledge. We expanded upon that knowledge by talking about a principle and then we applied that. Now, what I'm saying to you is it is very, very important for you to get into the mindset of thinking through clear narrative in your own words, in your own words. That's really, really important. Let the narrative flow according to how you might want to describe it to maybe a client of yours or a friend of yours who is asking a question. But let's think about the logic of this, because the chances are that once you've identified the relevant accounting standard, there is likely or not a definition within that standard that is very, very important. There is likely as not criteria within that standard that is very, very important. There is likely or not a principle within that standard that is very, very important. And what I'm doing is I'm providing this database of information in my narrative that I can then use to apply in the scenario in front of me. Does that make sense as a, as a very, very, uh, if you like, basic format for a discussion question? Does that sort of make any sense? And if, if you are 
in a situation where you're struggling to think about how do I get into this, then that's a really, really good starting point. Try and identify the standard. Try and identify definitions within the standard. Try and identify any criteria uh, within the standard. And then maybe think about the relevant principles within the standard and then look to apply those within your narrative. And you should be able to do this for most things. For example, if I said to you IFRS 5, IFRS 5, IFRS 5. What are we thinking about IFRS 5? Is it non-current assets held for sale and discontinued operations, discontinued activities? Yes, it is. Now, when is an asset classified as held for sale? Well, an asset is classified as held for sale. An asset is classified as held for sale if it were recovered principally through sale rather than use. There's a definition. There's a definition. An asset is held for sale if it will be recovered principally through sale rather than use. There is a definition. And of course, the principle is to measure and to present the asset now based on the fact that it is more likely than not that it will be sold within the uh, rel relatively short period of time rather than being used on a continuing basis. Obviously, the presentation changes because of that. Obviously, the measurement changes. And I say to you, are there criteria within the standard IFRS 5 in order to determine whether or not an asset can be classified as held for sale? Are there strict criteria within IFRS 5? Vicky says yes, Amna says yes, Tasneen says yes, right. So you're doing it, you're doing it. Even without me going through the criteria, you are aware that there are criteria and typically those criteria will be relevant to an understanding and an answer for the scenario. Remember the criteria for IFRS 5 or basically that the asset must be available for immediate sale in its present condition and a sale must be highly probable. Not probable, but highly probable. These are all relevant criteria. So this is what I say to you, please, in, in the time that you have between now and next Thursday. One of the things that it's important for me to get across to you is that you have to keep going back over the standards that you've looked at and thinking about definitions and thinking about principles, the objectives and thinking about criteria and then thinking about how you could frame your discussion. Not my words. My words are not important. It's important that you find a way to come up with good, clear narrative. It doesn't have to be pages long, but clearly in a discussion based paper like we are doing here, like we are doing. Yes. Um, then it's important that as much as possible, it's as much as possible that we can we can we can do this. I'm just saying, what if we are unable to recall the criteria? Well, that's one of the things that I say to you. Let's try and you know focus our revision on what you believe is important. So if I said to you, do, do you believe the criteria within IS 37 are important? I think you'll say yes. If I said to you, do you believe the criteria? within IS 38 for the recognition of development expenditure important. I think you'd say, yes, this is what we've got to be able to do as much as possible. So think about how you can frame your discussion. And if you like, a, a fallback position is to think about the standard, a definition within the standard, I've given you goodwill. Think about the principle, I've given you that for goodwill and provisions. Think about any criteria and then look to expand that database, look to apply that database into your narrative because it's the application that demonstrates, it's the application that demonstrates to the markers that you really understand how and why these standards are there and the challenges that us as preparers and users of financial statements have. This is what makes us strategic business reporters. OK, now, well, Tasneen is saying, how would the application be? Well, clearly, clearly, let's think about IS 37. If I know the criteria within IS 37, if I know the three criteria within IS 37 and I'm looking through a scenario where it might appear to be a provision, but clearly there is there is not a present obligation, then I can apply that, then I can apply my knowledge by saying, hey, it may look like there is a provision here, but clearly there is not because at this point in time, there is not a present obligation. Or at this point in time, there is not a probable outflow of economic benefit. 
there's only a possible outflow of economic benefit. Remember what I said to you, everybody, yesterday. It is very, 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 very important that you identify things in questions. You spend time. You spend time analyzing the narrative in front of you. And obviously, I can't go through every question that we have, please, um, because of the time that we have. But it's important that you you spend your time very, very clearly looking at what is in front of you. And don't assume that if you see a question to do with a pension scheme, that it is a, a de defined contribution scheme. Don't assume that if you see a, a question where there is a shareholding of 20%, you are not going to assume that automatically it is a, an associate, as we said yesterday. OK, so what I now want to do, please, what I want to do is to go back to our question jock at. Go back to our question jock at. Now, some of you have asked me, I put up a, um, a, a notice on uh, Facebook today um, to say to you that I will be putting up some um, solutions to some of the issues that we've been dealing with here. And I will put some of those up and I will be putting up um, some of the examiner's past comments um, on some of these questions. But again, it's I want to I want to really, really elaborate to you, please, that it's important that you do not get into the mindset of thinking that everything has to be a model answer. You must be in a position of being able to demonstrate relevance. And I'll go back to that by looking at this question here um, and the question of Tigre. Now, you demonstrated you demonstrated relevance yesterday by saying, hey, look at this. Look at this. We have a situation here. Let me get back to my little um, example here. We've got a situation here where we've got the acquisition, and I think we, it was a step acquisition. We went from a, an 8% holding to a 60% holding. Yeah, so let's get back to this question, Jockat, now. And we looked at this um, step acquisition, and you quite rightly identified a relevant point, which was the, the four, uh, the 8% holding. This figure here would need necessarily to be measured to its fair value acquisition. And we said that would produce a fair value gain of one. You're quite right in saying that. And then you also demonstrated relevance here by saying, hey, hold on a minute. Deferred tax is not just an issue that has an impact on the individual entity. It has an impact for the group financial statements as well. And let us let us just um, let us just elaborate on something here, please. Now, I'm going to ask you to read through, read through these words here, the fair value. Can you just read through this sentence for me, please, together? This sentence, the fair value of the identifiable net assets. And what I'd like you to do, please, is to send across to me which word of this introductory little paragraph here, this one I'm just highlighting here, which word here do you think is really, really important to any answer that you might provide, regardless of whether it's a, a computational answer or a discussion? What, what word do you think is really important in that little uh, set of words there? What do you think? Just have a few seconds to think about that. I'm not saying fair value. Well, I agree with you there for sure. I agree with you there. Tasneen saying, Ali's saying excluding. Natella, Natella, um, I hope I've pronounced that right. I'm so sorry. Um, is saying fair value in DFT. Hazan is saying net assets. Well, I tell you what I'm going to do here. I tell you what I'm going to do, because I think I agree with Ali here. I am going to underline. Let's see if I can do this neatly. I'm going to underline that word excluding. OK, now. Should the net assets be exclusive of deferred tax assets and liabilities or should they be inclusive of deferred tax assets and liabilities? Now, you know the answer because you gave me the answer yesterday. OK. Right, you're all saying inclusive. Now, can you see, please, can you see that if I was to obliterate, I don't know whether I can on here, but let's see whether I can do it. No, I don't think I can, actually. If I obliterate this paper with a highlight pen, with some sort of pink or green highlight pen, I'm sort of missing the point. But if I was to read through this 
little bit of narrative very carefully, I would see here this word excluding and something would go ding in my mind. It would be, oh, hold on a minute. Surely excluding means should be including. Does that does that sort of make sense? Yeah, I'm reading excluding and effectively I'm thinking, hold on a minute, that should not be excluding. We should be including. Does that does that sort of make sense? That is that is what I mean by getting into a mindset of actually doing proper planning and is reading what is in front of you and not reading what you think is in front of you. That is no different from me saying, hey, 20 percent, I'm going to start questioning this 20 percent to assume that that 20 percent is automatically an associate does that make sense because i think hopefully it does now you obviously do know this from what we did yesterday but i these are some of the words that i want to be careful with the fair value of the identifiable net assets of t gray excluding deferred tax assets and liabilities well hold on a minute we've got to make sure therefore that if we need to calculate the goodwill if we need to calculate the goodwill, it's no point saying the net assets are 45. No point saying the net assets are 45, because as we said the other day, those net assets also have to include the impact of the deferred tax liability that arises as a result of the net assets being 45, fair valued at 45, but the tax base only being 40. And you said right at the end of yesterday's session that therefore there is a taxable temporary difference of five. Let's multiply it by the tax rate. Let's get that deferred tax liability. You said quite rightly, because it's a liability, it's going to reduce the net assets. And therefore, if the net assets go down, you said to me quite rightly that the goodwill goes the net assets go down and the goodwill goes, the goodwill goes, the goodwill goes, the goodwill goes, net assets go down and the goodwill goes up. Absolutely right, as you're saying. Now, this is yet another example of a part of a consolidation question where you could be required to discuss. So it might be, it might be a question, it might be a little question about discuss how goodwill should have been calculated and you would explain here what goodwill is you'd explain the principle behind goodwill and you'd explain that as a result of everything being measured at fair value we need to consider any new deferred tax liabilities that arise and as a result of that if there are that reduces the net assets and has an impact on the goodwill figure and then i would say as a result of as a result of that, these are the relevant figures. And we would do a little calculation to back up our narrative. That's what you've that's what you've got. That's what you've got um, in here. OK, that's what you've got. Now, I am going to move away a little bit from this question um, purely and simply because I wanted you to um, just to be aware of this bit here um, at the top here to do with this step acquisition. Remember, the difference between a step acquisition and what we sometimes call a step up and this business to do with the deferred tax. And what I'd like to do before we um, before we move on is a couple of things. First of all, what I want you to do is to just can you identify any relevant accounting standard, please, for Roman numeral three? Any relevant accounting standard that comes to mind? Any relevant accounting standard? any relevant accounting standard Aminath says if the net assets go up does the goodwill go down you're absolutely right it's like a balancing act Ali says I is 38 I think you're absolutely right I is 38 very very good very very good all right let's do the same here let's do the same here what's this relevant standard what is the relevant standard for Roman numeral four please Roman numeral four Roman numeral four Roman numeral four Roman numeral four, what do you think? Right, okay, okay, very good. Mariam says I is 19, it looks like I is 19, doesn't it? Define benefit scheme. Right, very, very good, everybody, very, very good. All right, let's stop there. Let us stop here and let us just do something here, please. Um, current service cost, 10 million, let's just underline that figure there. Current service cost of $10 million. Now. I think when we looked at the pro formas for a DB scheme the other day, did we not say 
that the current service cost is recognized as an increase, a credit to the liability, and a debit to profit and loss. Is that correct? Is that correct? The current service cost is a credit to the liability and a debit to profit and loss. And you're saying to me, yes, here. Now, is that a cash flow? Is that $10 million a cash flow? Yes or no? Jody is saying no. Svetlana is saying no. Right. Mohammed is saying no. Ali is saying no. Brilliant. Now you are being strategic business reporters. So hold on a minute. What if I was doing, what if I was preparing the statement of cash flows for Jocat and I was using the indirect method to prepare the statement of cash flows? What would I do with the current service cost? What would I do with the current service cost? What would I necessarily need to do with the current service cost in order to, in order to produce the cash flows from operating activities? And Svetlana, Vicky, Abdullah, uh Jodian is saying add it back absolutely right because of course the current service cost is pushing down the profit but it is not a cash flow so if we were looking at the figures up here this is a group of course if we were looking at the figures up here there's the profit before tax of 59 remember what we're trying to do is to uh, convert the operating profit effectively into cash flow we would need to add that back in the same way we need to add back depreciation very very good very very good point now my point everybody is this you do not you would not be able to understand that if you were not aware of what was going on with is19 and it's your knowledge your understanding of what is going on within IS-19 that allows you, and the microphone is just falling apart here, that allows you to identify the, uh, the, the, the linking across to the different accounting standards. That's really, really good. Now, let's do the same here, please. Let's do the same here. Jocat owns an investment property. What's the, what's the standard there, please? What is the standard? Sikander is saying IS-40. Yes, it can be saying I is 40. Right. Brilliant. Brilliant. Now, you see, I'm now my mind is now getting into a sort of multitasking um, phase and I'm thinking, OK, you've identified I is 40. I think that is really, really good. Now, are there two different policy options available within I is 40? Are there? Yes. OK, so let's 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 take this further forward. Let's think about this, please. Do you believe that the shape of the financial statements will be different? And I'm not now referring to Jocket. I'm just referring to uh, another part of the syllabus, which arguably is interpretation. Do you believe the shape of the financial statements will be different if the policy is a cost policy? as opposed to if the policy for the investment properties is a is a fair value policy would the shape of the financial statements change absolutely right they would change now does that mean that the ability to make decisions on those financial statements could well change what do you think about that what do you think about that if the if the financial statements will change, does that mean the ability to make decisions may well change? And I think arguably the answer is going to be yes, yes. Now then I say to you this: which policy arguably is the more relevant policy for users, a cost policy or a fair value policy? Right, Bicky's saying fair value. Sikander is saying fair value. Svetlana is saying fair value. And all of a sudden, everybody, all of a sudden, you again are demonstrating to me that you are strategic business reporters, because what I'm doing in my mind is I'm visualizing how a different policy has an impact on financial statements and what I can take from those financial statements. And remember, at this level, at this level, at this level, interpretation and analysis is not about coming up with a set of eight ratios like it might have been under f7 or financial reporting as of course it is now but it's understanding how our accounting standards and the policies and the measurements and the classifications within those accounting standards have an impact on the shape of the balance sheet the shape of the p l the shape of oci for example that is what we need to be doing in the same way that clearly a defined contribution scheme is going to have a massively different impact on the shape of the financial statements as opposed to a defined benefit scheme. 
Okay, we know that, we know that. Now remember, if we were to do it deliberately, if we were to deliberately treat a D B scheme as a DC scheme, then of course you're gonna say to me one word, one word, one word, one word, one word. If I was to deliberately do something, Mariam's saying ethical problem, and I agree with you, if it's done deliberately, if it's being forced upon you, then I'm sensing some ethical issues and ethical dilemma. See, you are, you are all giving me very, very good answers here, and I think you're pretty, pretty good at this. Now, um, really, that's that's um, really all I wanted to, um, to say here, um, but there is another thing that I just want to get across to you, and let us just think about this, please. Let us think about our uh, headings, our cash flow headings, and of course, the cash flow headings the cash flow headings are cash flows from operating activities, cash flows from um, investing activities, and cash flows from financing activities. Now, here is a question for you, please. Let's let's just do this. Um, let me rub that out, and I'm going to put up here cash flows, cash flows from investing activities cash flows from investing activities. Now, I would like you, you don't know the ins and outs of uh, JockCat because I've not given you sufficient time to look at it, but that's not the point. What I'd like you to do, please, is to come up with some examples. I've got a query here about the sound. Can you just give me a quick nod as to whether the sound is okay because my microphone has moved somewhat. Is the sound okay? Thanks, thanks everybody, that's great. I'm happy with that. Now, can you please give me, thanks Letitia, can you give me, just throw out to me please, everybody, doesn't matter what order you wanna do it, but can you give me examples of cash flows from investing activities that you might, that you might find within a group, within a group, within a group, within a group uh, cash flow statement, okay? Within a group cash flow statement. Now, Svetlana is saying, dividends from subsidiaries. Okay, let's think about this, please. Svetlana is saying an investing activity, an investing activity could be a dividend, a dividend received, a dividend received, and I can tell the sound has changed then because my mouth is getting closer to the microphone. Dividends received, I don't think you want that, dividend received from a subsidiary. Now, is that correct or incorrect? In a group cash flow, dividend received from a subsidiary incorrect or correct what do you think what do you think what do you think what do you think kate is saying not subsidiaries and i agree with you because the subsidiary jockat and tigre of course the subsidiary is within the group and therefore is not a group cash flow because it is intergroup but let me change that because i think if i said you dividends received from associate dividends received from associate Yes. Would that make sense? Would that make sense? Dividends received from associate? Yes, because, of course, the associate is not part of the group. The associate is, of course, effectively like a, a normal third party, normal third party. So what if I said this cash to acquire an associate, cash to acquire an associate? And I'm presuming this would be a positive cash flow. That would be a negative cash flow. Would that be correct? Would that be a possibility? Cash to acquire a new associate. Cash to acquire a new associate. Would that be a, a possibility? Yes, it would. That's an investing activity. You're absolutely right. And what if I said this? Proceeds. Proceeds from selling. Proceeds from selling an associate. Proceeds from selling an associate. Would that be a possible cash flow from an investing activity? Yes. Right, your positive cash flow. Very, very good. Very, very good. What if I said this to you, everybody? What if I said this? Cash. Hmm, let's think about this. Cash paid. Cash paid to acquire. Cash paid to acquire a subsidiary. Cash paid to acquire a subsidiary. Okay, cash paid to acquire a subsidiary. Is that an investing cash flow? Yes, it is. 
Cash pay to acquire a subsidiary is, of course, an investing cash flow. That's a cash outflow. And let me take you back to let me take you back to Jocat here because you will notice that in Jocat, let me find um, the point here. You'll see here that the purchase consideration in Jocat on the first. December 2016 comprise cash 50 million, which of course will be an investing cash flow, and shares of 15 million, which of course is not a cash flow at all. And we see the shares, we see the issue of shares. Here it is. There is the issue of shares to acquire control of T grade. Good. Right. So that's very, very good. That's very, very good. Cash pay to acquire a subsidiary is very, very much a a uh, cash outflow because remember that is not an intergroup transaction that is a transaction between jocat and the former shareholders of tigre in the same way that proceeds proceeds from proceeds from selling or let me put it a different way i don't like that word proceeds from disposal proceeds from disposal of a sub proceeds from disposal of a sub presumably is a positive cash flow would you agree with that would you agree with that yeah would you agree with that what do you think about that yes absolutely right and already you can see here already you can see that if you were to compare what you might have done under f7 financial reporting for a single entity cash flow you can see that there are additional cash flows that we might need to consider uh, with a group cash flow statement and remember the chances are remember the chances are of you having to prepare a full cash flow statement are what are you going to say to me the chances of having to prepare a full cash flow statement are uh, bicky says remote and <laughs> nil chodian says nil i think you're absolutely right you i tell you you lot are brilliant at this very good Good. But you might be asked to discuss and prepare elements of that statement. That's most definitely um, a possibility, a definitely a possibility. Now, let's think about this, please. What if I said to you, what if I said to you, um, financing activities, financing activities, cash flows from financing activities. Um, if I said to you this, uh, dividend paid dividend paid to the NCI, dividend paid to the NCI, would that be correct? Would that be correct or would it be incorrect to have that as a financing activity cash flow? Correct or incorrect? Correct or incorrect? Yeah, it's correct, isn't it? Because again, this is a cash flow. This is a cash flow going out of the group. It's a cash flow going out of the group. And if we go back here, everybody, you'll see there is, there is, there is the dividend and of course what this is is if we imagine if we imagine we've got um, parent and we've got sub and we've got a 60 percent interest here there's our group and of course the dividend going out to the nci the dividend going out to the nci if the subsidiary pays a dividend of 1 million then 40 percent of that is going to go out of the group to the nci and is therefore quite rightly a financing cash flow hopefully that makes sense to you there and the point of this little um, discussion is just to get you to into the mindset just to get you into the mindset of thinking of the additional cash flows that necessarily come from a group cash flow statement so dividends coming in from the associate maybe cash to acquire associate maybe proceeds from selling an associate the cash to buy or sell a subsidiary company acquisition or disposal and then specifically with our financing activities good everybody that's very very good now okay um Tasneen is saying why do we not show in investing activities well this is a good point anybody want to clarify please why the dividend paid to the nci is a financing activity well let's think about this please what percentage of the net assets does the parent company recognize what percentage of the net assets does the parent company recognize in the group statements i know that i know the percentage you're going to give me I know the percentage you should be giving me. Come on, give me a percentage, please. What percentage of the net assets are recognized in the group financial statements, in the group balance sheet, in the group balance sheet? Of course, it is 100%. It is 100%. Let's go back here, everybody. Let's make sure we're happy with this. There's 60%. There is 40%. Yes, remember, if this is a controlling stake, then that is the NCI, of course, of 40%. I said to you yesterday, what percentage of the net assets of S 
does P actually control here? Well, of course, it's 100 percent, even though that's OK. It's OK. Someone's saying, sorry, it doesn't matter. It's 100 percent because they have control, but they only have 60 percent ownership. So in answer to the question, why does the dividend paid to the NCI go within financing? Well, because who finances that 100 percent of the net assets? Who finances those net assets? Well, 60 percent is financed by the group and 40 percent is financed by the by the 40 percent is financed by the. Tell me, please. 40 percent is financed by the NCI. So quite rightly, therefore, if there is a cash flow going out to the NCI as a return, if you like, on that investment, a return on that financing, then it needs to be a financing cash flow. Very, very good. Very, very good. Now, before we I'm trying to give you some, um, if you like, many things to think about here. And I sort of don't make any apologies at the moment for just trying to uh, flip across and think of many, many different things here. Now, what I want you to do, please, is this. What I want you to do is this. I'd like you to just, just spend a few minutes. We can do this together, reading through here. In fact, let's read this together. Let's read this through together. Let's read this to, together. Jockat operates in the energy industry and undertakes complex natural gas trading arrangements which involve exchanges in resources with other companies in the industry. Jocad is entering into a long-term contract for the supply of gas. Yeah, 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 okay, let's carry on, and is raising a loan on the strength of this contract. The proceeds of the loan are to be received over the year to the 30th of November 2018 and are to be repaid over four years to the 30th of November 2022. So that looks to me like a financial liability. Jockat wishes to report the proceeds as operating cash flow because it is related to a long term purchase contract. The directors of Jockat receive extra income if the operating cash flow exceeds a predetermined target for the year and feel that the indirect method is more useful and informative to users of financial statements than the direct method. Well, do you know what? This question is. I've updated this question, but it's it's a question from 2010. But it, yes, Kate says, I smell a rat here. Well, Kate, I think I'm with you on this. I think I smell quite a big rat. And of course, if you're if you're smelling rats, smelling rats, I think you're also smelling ethical issues. Amno says, <laughs> you've made me laugh here. This is brilliant. Now, without going into too much detail here, because I don't think we necessarily need to. What it says here, first of all, comment on the director's view that the indirect method of preparing statements of cash flow is more useful and informative and discuss the reasons why the directors may wish to report the loan proceeds. Well, I am, by the way, I am the trainee accountant. I am the trainee accountant for Jockat and the directors are coming to me and saying, Rob, uh, by the way, by the way, you will report, you will report this um, loan receipt as an operating cash flow. So they're coming to me as the training accountant and they are directing me. They're saying, Rob, whatever anybody's told you, the loan that we are receiving will be an operating cash flow. Do you smell, going back to Kate's phrase, do you smell a rat if they are telling me what I should and shouldn't do? Of course you are smelling a rat. Right. Ali says intimidation threat. Also, objectivity is compromise. OK, now, if if. I am the trainee accountant and I am being told to do something. Um, what do you think I could do about that? Do you know what, what do you think are my possible reactions to that? What are my possible actions in response to that? Because remember, remember, I think there's a difference between a new trainee and a final level accountant who is just about to qualify and I think there's a difference between a trainee who is maybe doing their final level exams and a newly qualified accountant because the chances are they will all have different responses to this because arguably if you're a brand new trainee to the company you might say mm, oh okay you know you're my boss I'll, I'll just do as I told yeah, I think that's that's a possibility, but I don't think we're going to see see that in our exam. I think we're going to be dealing with maybe higher level accountants who really should know what is going on. So if I know what really should be the correct thing here, then I've got 
I've already got a dilemma here. Now, what do I do? What are my options? What are my options? And the point is, everybody, what I want you to think about is to say in every question that you might see, oh, uh, the best thing to do is resign. I don't think that is necessarily going to be the correct answer. I don't think it is necessarily showing a depth to your argument. Do you agree with me there? If I said, oh, I, you know, OK, I'm, I'm, I'm not happy with this. I, there's nothing I can do about it. I'm going to resign. Do you think that's a good answer? No, I don't think it is. I don't think it is. Now, the point is, everybody, remember, in question two of the exam, question two of the exam, we don't know whether it's going to be for 20 marks, 25 marks, 30 marks. I would suspect it's likely to be between 15 and 25 marks. Remember that that is where you are going to have, at the very least, this ethical dilemma to consider. And this is exactly the sort of thing that you have to think about. You have to think about what is you are being faced with and what are the potential actions and maybe potential impacts as well as, as doing something, as, as making a decision to, to do something, to whistleblow, for example. What is the potential impact and, uh, of that? Now, the thing I just want to um, highlight here, please, and I will, we will, after we've had a break, we will look at um, some of the, the specimen exam papers. I want you to remember, please, that when you are looking at this ethical question, there are two professional marks available for you. Two professional marks, up to two professional marks. And I can't really spell professional marks, uh, but let's, <laughs> my spelling has gone mad. Let's give you this instead. Two professional marks. And I would not get any of those professional marks if I was to say, OK, uh, I know the directors are wrong, but there's nothing I can do about it. So I'm going to resign. I would not get any professional marks there. But if I started to show a degree of um, reasoning, if I started to show an understanding, if I started to develop a, a depth to my answer, a breadth to my uh, narrative, if I start to show qualities, if I start to show that, hey, these are not easy situations to deal with, because, you know, which way am I going to turn here? What are what really are my possibilities? Then all of a sudden I'm starting to show to the markers that I understand the realities of the real world and the workplace that we may all be faced with, the challenges in the, the workplace that we, we, we may all be faced with at some point. Hopefully that 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 makes a little bit of sense. So let us just go back to this here and quite clearly you've identified that there is an ethical um issue here. And I also would say to you this, please, when you're looking at anything to do with ethics, I'm sure you're all familiar with, you know, if I put down the words integrity, uh, integrity, come on, give me a word, everybody. What word do you want to give me next? What word do you want to give me next? Integrity, integrity. Anybody want to say, yes, Bicky's saying objectivity, objectivity. Very good. Very good. Anybody else want to give me anything here? Anybody else? Confidentiality. Very good. Confidentiality. Right. Right. Very, very good. Professional behavior. Professional behavior is um, who's saying that's Kate. Professional behavior. Very good. Professional behavior. And someone else was saying professional competence. Fetlan is saying professional uh, competence. Very, very good. Very, very good. OK, that's excellent. Now, you see, what is important for us to understand is that these are most likely issues that we will have to deal with when we are looking through our script, when we're looking through our exam paper, specifically with question two, because these are typically the issues that we will have to be dealing with um, in the real world. Now, the examiner, of course, has said many, many times that it is not sufficient for the candidates, that's us, to just write down this IFAC uh, code, if you like, and just write it down verbatim. No, it's more important that you understand what these words actually mean. So you've got to be in a mindset of actually being able to describe what do you mean by integrity? What do you actually mean when you talk about someone being objective? And as long as you can show a degree of relevance with that, then, of course, you will get very, very good marks for that. OK, so that's and Letitia said transparency. Right. Absolutely right. It's just expanding this and it's taking it away 
it's taking it away from just being a situation where you're basically saying, oh, I've wrote learned this, yeah? I've wrote learned this and, and this is what I can give to you. By the way, everybody, that is no different from me saying a provision is a liability of an uncertain timing or amount and there are three criteria to recognize a provision. That is basically sort of a rote learning uh, example. But if I then expand that and say, look, the principle behind this is as follows. And based on that, what we can see from the scenario is that it may appear to be a provision, but there's only a possible cash flow expected. And therefore, we're not able to recognize a provision, but we may well disclose a contingent liability. All of a sudden, what I'm doing is I'm taking my narrative, my discussion away from something that is just flat, and I'm, I'm just holding my hand out in front of the screen. He said, just flat. And I'm expanding it and making it relevant and I'm making it real and I'm making it something that is easy, easy for the markers to award us marks for. OK, now let us go back here, please. And I just want us to think about um, the direct versus the indirect method. Comment on the director's view that the indirect method of preparing statements of cash flow is more useful and informative. Well, I'll tell you what I'm going to do here. Um, we're not going to spend a huge amount of time, but I just want to think about it this. If I said to you, cash flows, cash flows from operating activities, cash flows from operating activities, and I promise in the real world my hand a lot better than this so cash flows from operating activities you know that actually what we do is we start off with the pbt and then i think in jocat we're going to add back the dividend or sorry not the dividend but the profits of the associate and we're going to deduct we're going to add back i should say the finance cost this is just um, a quick recap of uh, what we have in uh, jocat here and effectively that gets us to the operating profit line but then of course then of course what's going to happen is we're going to start adding things back like depreciation depreciation charges here yeah, depreciation charge depreciation charge brackets or no brackets please for every for that brackets or no brackets depreciation charge brackets or no brackets yeah everybody's saying brackets good what about this amortization 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 charge brackets or no brackets brackets or no brackets fantastic what if i said this what if i said this impairment what if i said this impairment impairment charges brackets or no brackets brackets or no brackets you add it back very very good what if i said this gain gain on gain on disposal gain on disposal of ppe gain on disposal of ppe brackets or no brackets there everybody brackets yeah absolutely right it's a deduction isn't it it's a deduction because of course what it is doing is it's pushing up the profits but it is not a cash flow very very good what if i said this what if i said this current service cost current service cost hmm. what's the what's the standard that of course is is19 brackets or no brackets brackets or no brackets right add it back it's not a cash flow no brackets very very good past service cost past service cost past service cost past service cost brackets or no brackets yes the same absolutely right the same very very good very very good very good what if i said this to you everybody remeasurements remeasurement remeasurement losses remeasurement losses we call them when we're doing the calculation we call them actuarial differences what about remeasurement losses and i think you might be falling into my trap here mariam says no adjustment i'm going to take that away because of course remeasurement losses are not remotely presented in our profit and loss they're not remotely to do with operating of course because they are presented in oci right good now <laughs> you see yes this is what you've got to be thinking of okay this is what you've got to be thinking of now that's why i sort of did that on purpose just to see whether you'd say hold on a minute that's not even relevant but what if i said this pension contributions pension contributions pension contributions 
brackets or no brackets, pension contributions, brackets or no brackets. Yes, it is actually the cash flow. It is actually the cash flow. And now what you've done here, specifically with these three lines here, is you said, hey, I understand the difference between the matching concept, which is about bookkeeping, which is not necessarily the same as cash, and cash flow, which is all about 100% cash. And what you've done here is you've indirectly, you've indirectly converted the operating activities into cash. That's very, very good. Very, very good. Now, of course, then once we've done all that, we have the working capital changes. And let's say increase, increase in inventory, increase in inventory. Let's have a, a decrease in receivables. And I'm doing this in abbreviation form, obviously. Let's have a decrease in payables, in payables. Okay. Okay, increase in inventory. Right, let's do inv increase in inventory first, please. Increase in inventory, brackets or no brackets. Increase in inventory, brackets or no brackets. Brackets or no brackets. Cash in or cash out. Cash in or cash out. Very good, everybody. Very good. Increase in inventory means there's more cash sitting in the warehouse, of course. Very, very good. What about a decrease in receivables? Brackets or no brackets. Cash in or cash out. Vicky says cash in. Brackets or no brackets, everybody. Brackets or no brackets, brackets or decrease in receivables. Receivables go down. That means cash goes very good. Cash goes up. What about a decrease in payables? Decrease in payables. Liabilities go down. Liabilities go down. Absolute right. You're all correct here. Liabilities go down. Cash goes down. Think about the simplicity of this, please. If you were to repay a loan, if you were to repay a loan or part of a loan, yeah, what's going to happen? Your loan is going to go down. Well, just think about a trade payable. When you settle a trade payable, the liability goes down, but your cash balance goes down. Right. Very, very good. Ah, this is a little bit. Ah. Now, the point of this is to say the following, everybody. Let me just move this across here because my screen is covered by something that you actually can't see, which is to do with uh, the all the workings of the, the Go webinar. Um, panel. Now, that's a pretty straightforward and pretty simple, pretty simple little exercise. Um, but let's let's put a net figure there, and that is net cash from net cash from operations. Net cash from operations. Now, I what I want you to do, please, is to think about this, which is the indirect method, and then compare it to the direct method. The direct method the direct method and the direct method is basically a situation that says cash received from customers cash received from customers which of course is cash in cash paid to suppliers cash paid to suppliers which of course is cash out, cash paid, cash paid to employees, cash paid to employees, which of course is another cash out, and cash, let's say cash paid for, I don't know, other costs, so let's say overheads, it doesn't really matter what we call it, but uh, other costs overheads cash paid for other cost overheads if you like okay so not necessarily the direct costs but the indirect costs and that is a another cash out okay now again let me just move this up a little bit here now okay it could be positive it could be negative but remember remember whatever figure you have whatever you figure you have under the and under the direct method, it's going to be the same as, as this figure here. There are two different methods of coming to exactly the same figure. So let me take that away for a minute. OK, now just look at this, please. Just look at this. Which one do you think is easier to understand? Yeah, which one do you think is easy to understand? Which one do you believe may provide more relevant information to the users here? Direct or indirect? Direct or indirect? Well, let's 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 make it like this to begin with. Which one, which one is just which one looks simpler? Which one do you think to the ordinary person who's picking up a set of financial statements? Which one do you think might make more sense? 
might be easy to understand. And I think it's looking as if the majority of you is saying direct makes more sense. Well, let's think about the logic of this, please. Let's think about the logic of this. If I had no understanding of financial reporting at all, and I looked at a disclosure and it said, I've received 100 million from customers. I've paid out 40 million to suppliers. I've paid out 10 million to employees and I've paid out 5 million to uh, for other costs. And I'm left with a net cash flow. That seems to me to be pretty clear. Seems to me to be pretty clear. But if I was to look at this, you're talking about operating activities, but you're actually starting off with PBT. I don't quite understand that. Um, you talk about a profit from associate, but you've um, you've put it in brackets. You talk about a, a gain on disposal of PPE, but it's it's in brackets. I, I don't quite understand that. You're talking about a gain, but it looks like a negative figure. I don't I don't quite understand that. Do you see that? Do you see that it becomes a little bit more complicated to understand? Not only because of that because of also all these lines that are required to take an accruals based figure, an accruals based figure based on all these accounting estimates like depreciation, amortization, current service costs, et cetera, all those estimated figures and converting it to cash. Does that make sense? It's, it's arguably a lot more difficult to understand what is going on with the indirect method than it is for the direct method. And because of the number of lines that potentially have to be in the, uh, the indirect reconciliation, as opposed to the direct method, which basically tells it how it is, tells it how it is. Does that, does that make sense? Does it appear that the direct method is just so relatively straightforward, relatively straightforward, as opposed to this thing here, which is all about converting. Now, let's think about this, please. Which one do you think is more likely to be open to manipulation? Which one do you think is more likely to be open to manipulation, indirect or direct? Right. Now, majority of you are saying indirect. Now, let's look at this, please. Let's, let's just look at this. Are there some issues to do with IS7 where there is potentially a number of headings that a cash flow can go under? And I say, yes, there are. For example, dividends paid. Sometimes it can go under operating cash flows. Sometimes there is a, a, a view that it can go under financing cash flows, finance costs. Finance, not I should say interest paid, not finance costs, but interest paid. Exactly the same thing. Sometimes it goes under uh, financing cash flows. Sometimes it goes under operating cash flows. It's a little bit vague on some of these classifications. Some of these classifications are a little bit vague. So as soon as there is an accounting standard where there is a little bit of um, maneuverability, if you like, then of course it leaves itself open to manipulation. But on the other hand, or maybe the most important thing is, look at this again, please. I really, really want to get across to you that Hey, some of these things here are difficult for the users to understand, especially when they do not have a high degree of financial reporting understanding. So, for example, for example, if there was a line in here that said new loan, new loan, new loan then arguably someone might say, oh, I can see that that's a cash flow. It's a new cash flow coming in. Well, well, OK, that's uh, yeah, that's clearly a cash flow. That's clearly a cash flow. And if I don't have a lot of understanding as to how a cash flow should be put together, I may not be in a position of being able to question that as going under an operating cash flow. So I may look at it and think, well, the directors must have done this correctly. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? The fact is that the indirect method, the problem, one of the challenges with the indirect method is that there is a lot of things to reconcile, which arguably allows it to be open to manipulation. Now, obviously, though, we know that that is not right. And any loan that is coming in is going to be a financing cash flow. So my point here is to think about is to think about some of the standards that we deal with, which are you know, sometimes a little bit open to manipulation. And remember why accounting standards are revised. Remember why we have the new accounting standards where the definition of control is so important. But I want you just to basically look at something like this and think, hmm, 
what did Kay say? I, I smell a rat. Yeah, why do I smell a rat? Well, it seems pretty obvious that the directors are wanting to wanting to make those operating cash flows as high as possible because they're going to be some sort of remuneration based on that. And so, in a way, in a way, I seven potentially allows itself to be manipulated like that because of the complications that we may uh, come across with the indirect method, which we don't necessarily see with the direct method. Okay. Now, again, what I'm trying to uh, get across to you here, everybody, is that, I, again, I'm going to use this phrase that Kate has used. I want you to be in a situation where you can smell the rat as you're looking through a question. And Remember what we said the other day. Remember what we said the other day. I do not believe you can have an ethical issue. I do not believe you can have an ethical issue without what, everybody? Without what? I do not believe you can have an ethical issue without an, without an, without an, what did I say? I said it the other day. I don't think it's possible to have an ethical issue without an accounting, an accounting issue yes what do i mean by that well i don't think it's possible to demonstrate that revenue is overstated unless you understand the principle behind revenue recognition i don't believe it's possible to determine whether an impairment charge has been deliberately understated if i don't understand how an impairment charge is calculated yeah it's all the same all, all coming back to the same thing i don't believe it's possible to determine whether a provision should or should not have been recognized unless i understand the principles behind the recognition of a, a provision does that does that make sense so as i read through this thing here i'm starting to formulate in my mind some of those issues to do with my understanding of cash flows and see whether i can direct that to a narrative answer which highlights some of the challenges that we have and maybe highlights some of the reasons why there could be manipulation going on and then comes back to this point about well what am i now going to do about it what can i do clearly i need to speak to the directors but if they turn around and say you're, you're a trainee go away what 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 can i do then is it that i try and go to a, another director of the board is it that i try and take some sort of legal advice these are the sort of things that we've got to consider now, remember, it says here in this question, two marks are available. Um, this is clearly a question one in P2. Let me stress again, please, that in your exam, we'll have a look at this after the break. In your exam, remember that the ethical question will, will allow you to gain up to two professional marks. Now, you've gone quiet on me. No, but I can't see any questions coming through now. So I'm going to ask you a question. Are you OK, everybody? Is everybody OK? I hope you're not falling asleep. I hope you were not falling asleep. Good, 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 good. Right, good. Now, <laughs> uh, Amna says, what a way. Good, 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 good. Can I take you back, please? Can I take you back? Can I take you back? Uh, where were we? Where were we? I left you with a little question yesterday, and we're going to do this before we have a break. I left you with a little question yesterday, which is which is this how we this is going back to traveler by the way traveler let's go back to traveler here this is what we were looking at uh, yesterday let me just change this so it's the width of the page okay now remember we looked at traveler yesterday yeah i looked we looked at traveler uh, yesterday and one of the questions i asked you is how would the initial figure for goodwill change if the policy for measuring the goodwill was partial goodwill now, did anybody come up with an answer for that? Partial goodwill. Anybody come up with an answer for how the goodwill will change? Well, let us just think about this, please. Because if the goodwill was partial, we know the policy, we know the policy is for the NCI is proportionate. It's proportionate. Now, if we recalculated the goodwill. Then what I'm going to say is this: the consideration, the consideration would still be a figure of 600 million. The figure would still be 600 million. But remember, yes, I'm not saying it reduces. Um, remember that we are now now only going to calculate the goodwill arising on our share of the acquisition of the net assets. So I'm going to say less the net assets acquired, less the net assets acquired. And let's go back up. In fact, I can take it from here. The net assets acquired were 935 
and I'm going to multiply that by uh, 60%. I think you would agree with me there. So let's do that little calculation. So 935 times 0 0.6 is a figure of 561. 561, and that gives us a goodwill figure of 39. Now, we said yesterday, which goodwill figure is higher, partial or full? And obviously the answer was full. And if we now look at this, if we now look at this, we can see that the goodwill figure that we did calculate yesterday was 60, and that was a full goodwill calculation. And the goodwill calculated under the partial method is 39. And of course, as you rightly think, and you've said, it will be lower. Now, my question therefore is this, how much, how much goodwill, how much goodwill is owned, how much goodwill is owned by the NCI? Uh, apparently we've got a problem with the audio. Let me just check on this here. No, it's back, it's back. Okay, how much goodwill is owned by the NCI if, oops, if partial? How much goodwill is owned by the NCI if partial? And the answer, of course, equals nil. Yes, you're saying that, absolutely right. You agree there, very good. How much if full? Give me the figure, please. How much if the answer was full? Uh, sorry, how much if the, how much, yeah, but I won't, give me a figure, please, not a percentage, give me a figure. What have we now proven, by the way? What have we now proven? Give me a figure, please, for the goodwill. If, if, if the policy is partial, if the policy for measuring the NCI is proportionate, you're quite right in saying that the NCI owns no. So if partial equals nil, if full, how much, how much, how much? Right, Amna's saying 21. I absolutely agree with you, Amna. Isn't that the case? Isn't that the case? That if we look at the figure that we calculated yesterday, the figure under the full method was 60, which of course is, which of course is 100% of the goodwill, and that figure was 60. Under the partial method, the figure that I just calculated for you, which of course is the goodwill arising on 60% of the net assets is 39. That of course proves that the goodwill that belongs to the NCI, if the policy, if the policy is full, would be 21. So what we can see here is of this of this 60, basically 39 is owned by the group and 21 is owned by the NCI. Can you see that, please? Can you see that? Can you see that? Can you see that? Just give me a yes. OK, good. Right. Now, that is quite important. That you can you can see the difference because it's proving what you said yesterday, which is under the fair value method. Goodwill is higher. The NCI is higher. Yeah, and any impairment charges would be higher. Now, that's the answer to the first part. Now, my question, please, is this. How would the change in ownership be accounted for if the policy for the NCI was proportionate? All right, now, did anybody do this? Well, here's our calculation from yesterday. Here is our calculation from yesterday. Where is it gone? Where is it gone? Where is it gone? Here's the calculation from yesterday. We had the original value for the NCI was 395. The post acquisition movement was 62. And at the point of the, the step up, we step up, they step down, it was 457. Yeah. And then we had this line for transfer to the group. Now, my question to you, everybody, is this. If we were to recalculate this, let's go back down here. Let's see if I can do it here. How would the figure change? How would the figure change if the policy was uh, proportionate? Now, what I'm going to do is this. I'm running out a little bit of space here. But let me just reiterate the question, please. How would the change in ownership be accounted for if the policy for the NCR was proportionate? Well, I'm going to say this to you, everybody. Here's the answer to it. Carrying amount of NCI, carrying amount of NCI at point of the change, carrying amount of the NCI at the point of the change, well, the point of the change occurs on the 30th of November, doesn't it? Yeah, 30th of November. Remember, it was just before the impairment uh, assessment. Well, surely, surely all we need to do is to go to our net assets that we looked at yesterday. Where is it? Where are the net assets? There they are, 1089. 
those are net assets at the reporting date which is the date of the step up so i'm going to pick up this figure i'm going to pick up this figure of 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 oh let's go back down here of 1089 and i'm going to multiply it by 40 percent because that is how much of the net assets are owned by the nci immediately before immediately before the change let's me, let me get rid of uh, this here to give me a bit more space so let's think about this 1089 times oops 1089 times is a figure of 436 436 436 yeah are you happy with that now why is it so straightforward why is it so straightforward well of course it has to be so straightforward because if the policy is proportionate if the goodwill is partial then remember that all the nci owns at any point in time is a share of the net assets a share of the net assets now isn't it quite interesting that if we go back to the calculation yesterday if we go back to the calculation yesterday and this is as per the question at the point of the change the carrying amount of the nci was 457 yeah, the carrying amount of the NCI, the point of the change in the original question yesterday was 457. But under the revised, what I'm giving you as a revised question, giving you as a revised question, the carrying amount is 436. Now, hold on a minute. What is the difference between 457 that we had yesterday, 457, and what we've got now? A 436 what's the difference in numbers the difference of course is the difference is ah 21 well surprise surprise what do you think that 21 is that 21 of course that 21 of course is the goodwill that is owned by the nci if the policy is fair value so what you're now doing is you're putting into practice you're demonstrating that you really do understand the difference between a fair value policy and a proportionate policy a partial calculation versus a full calculation so what of course would now happen is we would say transferred 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 to the group transferred to the group and let's have the figure please let me again get rid of this let me get rid of this let me get rid of this so transfer to the group i'm going to pick up the figure of 436 and i'm going to multiply it by what was it was it 20 over 40 was it 20 percent over 40 percent was that the right figure yesterday was that the right percentage just give me a quick uh, figure there please is that right four three six times four three six times 20 over 40 is that the right percentage is that the right percentage yes it is right so we do exactly what we did yesterday which is two one eight very very good which of course means that we're left with a carrying amount of two one eight the same the same principle the same calculation but we're now doing on a different figure because we're now looking at the nci under partial proportionate rather than rather than um, under the fair value method which of course means that if we went down into oce we went down into oce we would now have consideration to acquire the extra 20 percent consideration what was the figure it was 200 and 20 consideration of 220 yeah keeping that figure the same we would have transferred we would have transferred transferred from the nci transferred from the i and the figure of course is a figure of 218 remember the bookkeeping entries here for the consideration credit the bank and debit oce and for the NCI, the transfer, we know it's debit to the NCI and credit OCE. And we're now left with a figure. We're now left with a figure of two. Uh, brackets or no brackets, everybody. Brackets or no brackets. Brackets or no brackets. Brackets or no brackets. Consideration is 220. Transferred from the NCI. Ali says brackets. Very good. What word do you want me to write here, please? Do you want me to write negative or positive? Negative or positive? 
negative or positive? Negative or positive? Alice says negative, and I absolutely agree there. So negative movement, negative movement in equity, negative movement in equity. Do I present it as a loss? Do I present it as a loss? Yes or no? Do I present it as a loss? Yes or no? Tell me, please. Is it a loss? Yes or no? Do I ever present this in OCI or PL as a loss? Yes or no? Absolutely right, Letitia. And Bicky says no. Of course not. No, it's not. Because remember, you only have a gain or a loss when you go in, when you acquire control, and when you lose control, when you have a disposal. Everything else, as we saw here, is just a shift in equity. Now, can you see? Can you see? Remember, please, OCE, everything in OCE does not necessarily get presented in OCI. Now, can we see that as a result, I know this is a little bit messy and I really apologize for this. I'm really not a messy person. I promise you that. But if we look at this, what you've now done is you've demonstrated how the figures change depending upon the pro, depending upon the policy for the NCI. And so what was a positive movement if the NCI was being measured at fair value now becomes a negative movement once the policy is proportionate purely and simply because of this difference in ownership who owns goodwill and who does not own goodwill? That's what I want you to think about, please. And it, it, you've, you've demonstrated through what you've given to me here that you start to understand or you are understanding this fundamental difference between how a policy that is proportionate has an impact on the P&L and the balance sheet that is different from the fair value policy. Now, here's a question for you, please, before we, uh, before we uh, have a little break. IFRS 3 allows the group to determine the policy for the NCI on a subsidiary by subsidiary basis. So if I've got subsidiary one, and I've got subsidiary two, and I've got subsidiary three, and I've got subsidiary four, then I could have a policy here for subsidiary one of this partial fair value, subsidiary two that is partial, subsidiary three that is partial, and subsidiary four that is fair value. Okay, what do you think about that? Do you what do you think about that? Do you think that is a, a is a is a good is a good standard, or do you think that is a potential weakness in the standard? What do you think about that? What do you think about that? Bicky says a weakness. Tasnim says a weakness. Abdullah says there's no consistency. Absolutely right. Absolutely right. Now here's a great point. For you everybody because basically what you're saying is what you're saying is do you know what i don't quite understand why they're doing this within the standard but clearly that suggests to me that there is a lack of comparability there's going to be a lack of consistency which is going to have an impact on the understanding of the financial statements and yet again, what you're doing is as a result of just being aware of parts of the accounting standard, you're starting to demonstrate now an awareness of how things have an impact on the understanding of the financials, on the understanding, on the ability to make decisions from what is presented to you. Does that does that make sense, please? Does that make sense? And it, to be honest, is one of the reasons, one of the reasons why IFRS 3 is, is going to be revised at some point. And it's one of those standards that is being uh, looked at uh, by the Accounting Standards Board. It's a brilliant standard, IFRS 3, but it is not without its challenges. So please remember this, because you may have a situation in, in an exam question where you are dealing with two subsidiaries, and one of the subsidiaries is proportionate and one of them is fair value, as we indeed saw with Traveller here. That is exactly what is going on with Traveller uh, and Data and Captive. And please be aware of that, and be, please be in a situation of being able to discuss what you might consider to be a potential problem with that. OK, everybody, it is uh, well, it's coming to three o'clock here, two minutes to three. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to be very, very generous. And let's say come back at 10 past the hour, please. So I see you. Well, I think it's going to be uh, seven. We're back to our usual seven. Oh, I can't write seven, ten in Pakistan. It'll be uh, 10 past three here. I'm going to put you on mute for a while, everybody. Have a enjoy your shortish break and I speak to you in a bit.
Right, everybody, are we back? Are we here? Do you just want to give me a quick nod, yes or no? Are we back? Patricia says here, good, 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 good. Right, fantastic. And uh, again, just sound okay? Is the sound okay? Is the sound okay? Just check this. Good. Thank you, Ali. Thanks very much. Uh, very quickly, everybody, I've got a question um, coming from um, Abdullah. Um, please, would you demonstrate how to answer a question using conceptual framework when I'm not sure about the relevant IAS or IFRS? Well, actually, this is a, this is a very, very um, good, very, very good question. And let's just see whether we can um, summarize um, summarize this. Um, let me think about. Um, let's just think about this. I have um, I've got a, a new laptop, so I'm going to say to you that I've got a new laptop computer okay now i'm going to ask, ask you all and to be honest i may actually direct this to um, abdullah see whether this uh, makes any sense um i don't need you to know the relevant accounting standard for this laptop computer but what i do want to ask you is should i shall i will i recognize it as an asset Will I recognize if I buy, I have bought a new laptop computer, will I recognize it as an asset? And I, I just want to see whether uh, Abdullah uh, mainly will. Uh, Abdullah, are you saying yes? Right. OK, so this is good. This is good. Now, you don't need to know. Everybody else can join in here. This is not uh, just a two way conversation, but um, I want to see. Right. Why? So there's my question. Why? Why will I recognize it as an asset? Why will I recognize it as an asset? Why will I recognize it an asset? Mohammed is saying if I control it, yes. Why will I recognize it an asset? Amna is saying future economic benefit. Abdullah is saying controlled by the entity. Sano is saying for its use in the business. Uh, characteristics of the elements met. Future economic benefit measured reliably. Well, actually, you're all coming up with <laughs> points of the same thing. Let me let me put it like this, because I think we are getting there, which is is it true to say that the only reason or the reason why I bought this uh, laptop computer is to obviously is to help me with my business and therefore as a result of using it in the future, it is, is it is going to help, it is going to generate economic benefit for me in the future over a number of periods, over a, uh, a number of years, for example, and, and therefore that, that is why it is an asset. It is, it is not necessarily the computer that is the asset per se, but is that resource, it is that benefit that I'm expecting from it that is the asset. Does, does that make sense? Does that make sense? Does that make sense? Okay, now, Abdullah, let me ask you this, and, and please, this, I, I'm saying Abdullah, but everybody else is, as well. Um, what if I said to you, I actually am in the business of selling laptops? Would I still recognize it as an asset? If I was in the business of selling laptop computers, would I still would I still recognize it as an asset? And don't don't just rush into it, everybody. Think about think about. I'm not saying to you that you need to tell me the accounting standard. I'm not saying the accounting standard. I want you to think about this. I'm saying that I've got a laptop computer here. I bought it for my use. You're saying quite rightly I should recognize it as an asset. You don't need to know the standard. I want you to, but you don't need to. I'm now saying to you, look, I'm in the business of selling laptops. So if I acquire a laptop to sell it, am I still going to recognize it as an asset? Yes or no? Yes or no? Yes or no? Well, I'm now getting a mixture of answers. And so let's clarify this. Well, if I've bought the laptop computer to sell, now let me start again. If I bought the laptop computer to use, will I be generating economic benefit from its use? If I buy a laptop computer to use it, will I be generating economic benefit from its use? Right. So it is therefore it is therefore going to be recognized as an asset. If I buy the laptop computer to sell it, am I going to be generating economic benefit? Yes or no. If I buy the laptop computer to sell it, am I going to be generating economic benefit? Yes. Where? Past or in the future? Past or in the future? Past or in the future? Pastor, ah, right. So, OK. Now, therefore, you're now telling me that actually I don't really need to know the difference between PPE and inventory. What I want to know is what is the fundamental characteristics of what you've done? 
because if you've done something that is generating, is likely to generate benefit for you in the future, then it looks to me as if it's going to be an asset. Does that, does that make some sort of sense to you all? Does that, does that, because what I want to, what I want you to do here is to, is to in a way answer Abdullah's question, which is, hey, in an ideal world, <clears throat> excuse me, in an ideal world, we would know everything about every accounting standard. Well, <laughs> we don't live in that world. There are always going to be things that will challenge us every day. Things will be there that will challenge us. And so what we try and do when we need to and when we want to is we want to be able to use an understanding of fundamental principles, fundamental principles. So let's find a way of explaining that the reason why I'm going to recognize this is because I'm looking for an expectation. I've got an expectation of economic benefit coming to me in the future. That is that is what that is what happens. That is what I'm now thinking about in terms of um, whether I should recognise something as an asset or not. For example, let's let's go back to this, please. Let's go back to this. Um, and I, I, to be honest, we could spend five hours going through this uh, because it is so important. But at the end of the day, it's 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 the bedrock of, of what we're doing. Let me ask you this, please. Um, this laptop computer, this laptop computer that I've bought to sell, that I've bought to sell, I've had to pay delivery costs in order to get it into my warehouse. OK, what happens to the delivery costs? Do they become part of the cost of the inventory? Yes or no? Do they become part of the cost of the asset? Right. Yes. Why? You don't need to know the ins and outs of IS2, but surely the, the relevant principle is that you do not have the asset to sell unless you pay for the delivery cost to get it into your warehouse. Does that make sense? In the same way that if I bought a laptop computer to use it, I don't have that asset. I don't have that laptop computer unless I've paid for the delivery cost to get it into my office. In the same way that you do not have the rights to a professional footballer unless you pay for the agent's fees to transfer those rights to you. Isn't it all the same principle? Isn't it all the same principle? And I think your answer to that is going to be yes. And of course, what is happening is it's the accounting standards, IS 16, IS 2, IS 40, IS 41, IFRS 5, that are putting into practice the application of those principles so let me ask you this please let me ask you this i bought the laptop computer on credit do i have a liability i bought the laptop computer on credit do i have a liability do i have a liability abdullah tell me please what do you think do i have a liability yes why why because i've done something it is it, it is going to create some sort of future outflow of cash right okay all right. Now, what about this? What about if I say this to you? The laptop computer causes environmental damage that I've got to rectify. The laptop computer, I know this might be a bit far fetched, but the same principle applies. The laptop computer creates some sort of environmental damage that I have to rectify. Do I have a liability? Do I have a liability? Same. Yes, of course I do. Abdullah, you're saying it right. And so you're basically saying, to be honest, I don't really need to know the ins and outs. Of course, I want you to know the ins and outs. But where you do not know the ins and outs of an accounting standard, then what you need to do is to fall back to a demonstration of relevance. And the markers will look at your script and they will go, wow, this is really, really good. This is really, really good. You're demonstrating that you understand that you've done something that is creating something for you that is now unavoidable. And therefore, we now need to try and recognize that within the financial statements. What I'm saying to you is that, hey, because you know IS-16, because you know IS-2, because you know IS-37, then what you're doing is immediately demonstrating how those principles from the framework are applied within the accounting standard. So. The point is that the examiner is very, very keen 
for all of us to demonstrate an understanding of a conceptual framework. And that doesn't mean to say an understanding of every single line within the framework, but some of these principles, and of course, one of those key principles is that we understand what an asset is and what a liability is and what income is and what expenses are and what uh, equity is, for example. So in a nutshell, Abdullah, that is what I would say to you. And I think you've actually sort of brilliantly answered your own question because some of the responses that you're giving to me here on the Q&A uh, panel. Now, I'm conscious that um, it is 20 past the hour and there's a few things that I want to go through with you before we do. Um, Abdullah, it is my pleasure, absolutely my pleasure. Can I ask you to do this, please? I've um, one, of the, one of the questions that um, was transferred to you was this question called Rose. And it's one of the questions where I, I'm actually going to put up on the Facebook page the um, uh, the examiner's model answer to this and this is not for the reason that you will be required to prepare a consolidated financial statements because we know that's happened but we could be required to produce elements of those you will see within the question there are some relevant accounting standards but based on some of the things that we've been discussing over the first or over our sessions please all i'm going to do is ask you pleased to do this and I'm actually, I'm actually you might be amazed by this you might be amazed everybody but I'm going to go silent for about a minute two minutes and what I'd like you to do please is to read through note one and I'm going to say nothing I'm going to give you two minutes read through note one please Are you still there? <laughs> so am I, right? <laughs> Good. Have you read through note one? Or did I not give you long enough? Right. Does this look familiar? Are there familiar points here? Are there things here that are familiar to us? Yeah, that look a little bit familiar. OK, good. Now, is there one word especially that anybody highlighted? Is there any is there any word that anybody particularly wanted to feel about highlighting? Amna says excluding. Mohammed says full goodwill. Crystal says excluded. Tasnin says included the patent. Excluding. Patent. Right. Spot on. This is now demonstrating to me that you are reading through questions and reading what is in front of you and highlighting that there are these words that could have a real impact on the difference between, well, a not bad answer and a very, very good discussion. You'll notice that the fair value of the identifiable net assets recognized by Petal was 120 million, excluding the patent below. The identifiable net assets of Petal included a patent which had a fair value of four million should that be included in the fair value of the net assets at acquisition should it be included why of course it should because the principle is to compare the real value of what the acquirer is prepared to pay against the real value of what has been acquired even if those assets and liabilities have not actually been recognized or recognized at their fair value by the entity that is being acquired right absolutely spot on absolutely spot on very very good very very good you've identified that you've identified that there is full goodwill going on so you know the policy for the nci is fair value and now as a result of that 
maybe you can start to formulate a possible discussion here in your mind, knowing that, hey, at the reporting date, there was an increase in ownership. That's not an increase in control, but as a shift in ownership from the NCI to the group. And we start to think about maybe the relevant calculations coming from that. And as a result of becoming familiar with these things, you're starting, you're starting um, to become a little bit more aware of a writing style and the sort of things to be looking out for. And that is really, really, really good. Now, remember that we have a situation here for whatever reason, the patent was not being recognized. It needs to be recognized upon acquisition in the group accounts. And obviously, if it's now being recognized in the consolidated accounts, it is going to get amortized in the consolidated accounts, not in the entities accounts, but in the consolidated accounts. And that, of course, is why why you're told here about the remaining life of four years. And I could now start to ask you about, hey, tell me what amortization is about. Is amortization about value or is it about the allocation of cost? And if this was to do with cash flows, I could say to you, hey, discuss with me, please, why we need to add back the amortization charge when we're doing a group cash flow. Can you see here, everybody, that from this little, little paragraph, these few words, these few words, these few words, I can formulate different questions. I can formulate different thinking in my mind, okay? Now, as I said to you, I'm going to um, put up, this is one of the things I'm gonna put up on the, uh, the Facebook page, uh, the examiner's model answer. Please remember, this is not because you will have to prepare the consolidation, but this is a very, very good question to help demonstrate some of the other issues you may come across, specifically foreign exchange. OK, and one of the things that I would really, really um, encourage you to to have a look at, please, in this question is the the answer that you'll see to do with how you determine the functional currency of an entity. And remember that you've got to be aware of the difference between translating from the foreign currency into a functional currency and translating from the functional currency into a presentation currency. And that is quite nicely demonstrated in this um, in this question here. And you'll see the narrative to go with it. But that's what I wanted to um, illustrate here, please. And I'm really pleased that what you're now doing is you're getting into a mindset. You're getting into a mindset of being able to read through a question and, and be careful with what is in front of you. Good, 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 good. Uh, a couple of questions coming through. Um, amortization, please remember, is basically the same as depreciation, but we typically talk about amortization for intangibles. And remember that residual value is basically what we currently expect to receive from the asset when it's disposed of at the end of its useful life. That is basically what we mean by residual value. OK, now uh, let's a lot of now I'm just going to make sure, please, that you really um, understand this before we do move on. If I said to you I'm going from 40 percent to 60 percent, I personally will call that a step acquisition because we are stepping in how we get control. If we go from 60 percent to 70 percent. I personally call that a step up because we've already got control and we are now just gaining a further ownership. Just to clarify um, something that you're asking me in the question and answer panel. Now, what I'm going to do now, everybody, um, based on the, the half an hour that we've got left, I am going to shift across to a couple of, well, in fact, the two specimen papers that we have for SBR. And I want to um, illustrate a couple of things to you here, please. And one thing I will do before we move on is to make you, I hope you really are aware of this. And what you now see in front of you is the, the ACCA's website and the page for SBR within the ACCA website. And I would honestly say to you, please, it is very, very important that you go through and have a look at the resources that are available for you. And that includes technical articles. And let me just better cut onto this page. Technical articles. And you'll see there's one here, very recent article on additional performance measures. Uh, which, of course, is potentially an issue for us within the exam. Now, I'll elaborate on that a little bit more before we conclude. But let's go back here. Let us go back here. And what do you have in front of you now? And I'm not sure whether this was on the, um, the panel yesterday or today. Um, 
but you have in front of you here the specimen exam paper number one okay and this was a question this is an exam paper question one now remember question one is going to be on group accounting but if i quickly go across here you what word do you think you're going to see if i move down here you're going to see the word prepare or discuss what do you think it's going to be because there's a lot of narrative there what's the word going to be discuss or prepare for genre says discuss yes 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 good 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 and of course the word when we get to it or oh, explain well they're basically the same thing isn't it explain discuss it is narrative and look at this please explain to the directors with suitable workings explain with suitable calculations discuss with suitable workings how the pension scheme should be dealt with and you'll notice you will notice in this question you have elements of accounting non-consolidation issues we've got a pension scheme here and we've got elements to do with consolidation and you'll notice that the consolidation part is to do is for 15 marks well remember that there that 15 marks will be made up of narrative and discussion which goes to show let me uh, remove this which goes to show that we said yesterday that the maximum the maximum calculation marks for the consolidation will be a maximum of 25 well that clearly is a lot less in this specimen exam paper now what we're going to do is please is this i want you to really 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 again be careful of the wording so let us go back here and let's read this through together on the 1st of June X6, Kuchin acquired 70% of the equity interest of house. The purchase consideration comprised of 20 million shares of $1 at the acquisition date and a further 5 million shares on the 31st of December X7 if house's net profit after taxation was at least 4 million for the year. Let's stop there, please. Let's stop there. Let's stop there. Do you know what I'm going to do? Do you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to highlight this word, if. Okay? If. What does that mean? What they're going to the purchase consideration comprised 20 million shares of one dollar at the acquisition date and a further five million shares on the 31st of December X7 if houses net profit after taxation was at least four million. Right, some of you are saying contingent consideration. Okay, contingent consideration. Brilliant answer. Now, please answer me this do we include contingent consideration or do we exclude contingent consideration do we include it or do we exclude it in our goodwill calculation include or exclude and akisha is saying include at fair value kate is saying include if there is a likelihood sikander is saying include well i tell you what i'm going to do i'm going to go back and say hey let's let me think this through Goodwill is the difference in the fair value of the consideration and the fair value of the identifiable net assets. The principle, the principle is to compare the real value of what the acquirer is prepared to pay against the real value of what the acquirer has acquired. Now, just look at that principle, please. Principle, the objective is to compare, is to find the difference after comparing the real value of what the acquirer is prepared to pay against the real value of what I've actually is going to be acquired. Now, if I think of that principle, do I, will I, shall I include contingent consideration? Will I, shall I, would I need to include contingent consideration? Crystal saying yes. Vicky saying yes, at fair value. Yes, Kate is saying yes. Right, fantastic. And now what you've done is you've already started to answer the question. You've started to answer the question because we now know that if we are calculating goodwill, we know that the goodwill has to include the contingent consideration at its fair value because that is the principle as reflected by the definition uh, within IFRS 3. Very, very good. So it seems to me that we are going to bring in some contingent consideration and it looks to me as if we're going to look at the share price to do that. In accounting for the acquisition of house, 
The finance director did not take into account the NCI in the goodwill calculation. He determined that a bargain purchase of 8 million arose on the acquisition of house, being the purchase consideration of 40 million, less the fair value of the identifiable net assets of house acquired of 48 million. The valuation was included in the group financial statements. After the directors of Kuchin discovered the error, they decided to measure the NCI at fair value at the date of acquisition. The fair value of the NCI in house was to be based upon quoted market prices, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, without again looking at the question, looking at the question, should they have included the NCI at fair value? Should they have included the NCI at fair value? Yes, of course they should. Right. Yes. Now let's think and. Nikish is saying the exclusion of the NCI would affect the goodwill calculation. Of course it would. Of course it would. Of course it would. Now, here's something else to consider, please. And my mind is now going wild with all the possible uh, permutations that we could have here. Let us say this. Let us say if I said to you that the consideration was 100 and the NCI was, well, in this case, they're not bringing in. So bringing in as zero and the net assets were 120, then what we have here, of course, is a, well, what are you gonna call that figure of 20? What are you gonna call that figure of 20? If I give you those basic figures, what are you gonna call that figure of 20? You're gonna call it Bicky saying a bargain purchase. Absolutely right, absolutely right, absolutely right. And if I was if I was thinking of an ethical challenge here, I would say, yeah, and I know why the directors want to have a bargain purchase, because remember, a bargain purchase gets credited straight away to retained earnings and therefore pushes up the profits. Now, I'm not saying this is an ethical question, but I'm starting to think about it because we know that. As a result of a bargain purchase, I'm not saying that's the situation here, what we're told to do is immediately go back, remeasure the consideration to ensure it's not been understated, and to remeasure the net assets to ensure they've not been overstated. So let's now bring in the NCI, let's bring in a figure of 30, and all of a sudden we've got a positive goodwill figure of 10. So you know, even just reading through the question without looking at detail at the requirements that you know that there is clearly going to be an impact on the goodwill calculation. So let us go to the requirements. And there's one word that I think is important here, and it's explained to the directors of Kuchin with suitable workings how goodwill should have. Look at that, please. Should have. Should have been calculated. And the difference is this. If I said to you, explain to me how goodwill should be calculated, that is a generic discussion about, well, goodwill is the difference between da 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 and da 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 da. But as soon as I say to you, as soon as I say, can you explain to me how goodwill should have been calculated, what you're now doing is you're pushing out that, de that definition and making it specific to this question. You're making it specific to this question based on that point. Therefore, the NCI, based on that that point, therefore, the NCI should have been included and the contingent consideration should also have been included at its fair value. I'm not looking in detail at the question, please, but what I am doing is looking at the wording because it's the wording that is very, very important. Very, very important. Tell me, please, that you can see the difference between should be calculated and should have been calculated, because one is showing that you can relate things specifically to the question. And you're doing that by looking at, in reality at what is going on here. OK. The significance of this, Letitia is saying, yes, good. The significance of this, please, is that it clearly says to me, it clearly says to me that if you have not looked through the specimen exam papers so far, you really, really need to be doing this because it will get you into that mindset again of looking through requirements, saying to yourself, this is clearly, this is clearly a discussion paper and not a computation question. Yeah. And is saying to me, let me reiterate this point for a couple of you. Let's see. Now, if I take out this word, 
let's see whether this makes sense. If I say to you, explain to the directors of Kuchin with suitable workings how goodwill should be calculated. Oops, should be calculated. I made a right mess of that, haven't I? Made a right mess, sorry. Right. I think this for a couple of your benefit here. Should. Okay. I want you to see that if I said to you, explain with suitable workings how goodwill should be calculated, that is a, a generic discussion about, well, goodwill is the difference between the consideration and the net assets at fair value. Consideration can include cash paid now, cash paid later, contingent consideration, share for share exchanges, loan notes. And I'm going off at some sort of rambling generic discussion. But as soon as I change that and I bring it into how goodwill should have been calculated, then the discussion becomes more direct based on what we have here within this question, not another question, but this question, and it allows me to shape my narrative. So yes, I may well come up with a definition. Yes, I may well come up with a principle. And then very clearly and very quickly after that, I'm going to be saying, and based on that principle, therefore, the NCI should be included at its fair value and the contingent consideration needs to be recognized also at its fair value. And what I'm now doing is I'm making my answer specific to the requirements of this question. Does that make a little bit of sense, everybody? And it's no different from, in a way, saying to you, make sure you understand when you see the word exclude. Yes, it's just making you more directed in terms of your answer and your narrative, okay? Kate is saying, is the key to doing this question looking for the answers in the scenario? Well, to be honest, Kate, this is what I say. This is what I say. If I'm if I'm looking at a question, and it is the question between whether it is a DC scheme versus a DB scheme, then to be honest, as I'm, le as I'm reading through the narrative, I already know what it's going to be. I already know from an understanding and from reading the narrative what the answer is going to be. Now what I've got to do is to find a way of getting to that answer knowing that if I come straight in and say it's a DB scheme, I'm not going to be getting the marks that I deserve. But if I come in and say, hey, this is the definition, this is the principle, this is why it might look like a DC scheme, but this is why in this question it is most definitely DB scheme, then I am getting lots of these marks. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? And quite Yes, you state the Tasnian saying, can we state principles in our own way? Absolutely. You state them in your own words. As long as you are demonstrating relevance, you will be marked very, very well, however you want to explain it. Remember, it's not about the quality of your English. It's not about the quality of your grammar. It's about the quality of the relevance that you are showing within your answers. Now, Please look at this. Please look at this. Oh, in actual fact, let, I'm going to I'm going to do something really naughty. I'm going to jump across to the specimen exam number two. Specimen exam number two. Now, again, you've got question one, which is a consolidation question, but there are going to be a oh look, we've got a convertible bond there, so we've got non-accounting, non-consolidation issues. And again, look at this, please. In respect of the investment in Chandler, explain with suitable calculations how goodwill should have been calculated. Can you see there's a similar theme going on here? There is a similar theme, okay? Uh, Sono, please do not write in print form. Please do not write in print form. Please, let me do this. Please do not write in print form. The only reason I'm writing this in print form is to make it a little bit clearer. Please do not write in print form. I promise you that my handwriting is actually quite good. But I also promise you, please, that the, you will be looked upon very favorably if the markers can read your handwriting. So please, please, please make make your life easier by making their life easier. Um, it's always good for any marker, I'm sure, to see some uh, good handwriting that they can read. But please not in print form. It's going to slow you down enormously, obviously, obviously. OK, now print form is basically capital letters. OK, now, before we move on, look at this, please. How good will should have 
been calculated. So I think there's going to be a similar issue there, a similar, similar issue. OK, and this is a, um, a specimen exam paper, please, that, again, I would very, very highly recommend that you have a look at. Now, going back to specimen exam paper number one, Abbey is a company which conducts this is question two. discuss the ethical and accounting implications of the above situations from the perspective of the reporting accountant. Now, please, you can see here. You can see here that this question is worth 20 marks. Do we know how much it will be worth come next Thursday? No, we don't. It could be 20, it could be 25, it could be 15, it could be, it could be 30. But remember, as I've said earlier to you, you're going to get two up to two professional marks for the quality of your discussion to do with the ethical dilemma, to do with the breadth of your answer. If you just say resign, it's not going to be sufficient. You've got to illustrate the relevance that you understand. The, you've got to illustrate that you can see that there are challenges here that we necessarily need to face or we may be faced with um, in our own work environment. OK, so let us please think about this. Remember, please remember that is it. Are these two things linked together? Accounting issue and ethical issue are these two things linked together what do you think yes or no accounting issue ethical issue accounting issue ethical issue yes i think they are tasney thanks so much for your very kind comments accounting issue ethical issue i don't think you can have one within with one without the other now as you as you read through this question here which i really would encourage you to do uh, pretty pronto, you are going to find you are going to find many accounting issues, some of which will have ethical issues as well. So the question then becomes, how do you approach that? How do you approach it? For example, for example, could it be that you set up a little heading to talk about related party transactions, related party transactions? Now, just bear with me a second, everybody. I'm just going to have to put you on mute very quickly. Bear with me. Right, I'm back. We had some noise. I'm back. I'm back. I'm back. Now, the question is, through this question, could you look at the issue of related parties and start to talk about the accounting issues to do with related parties? So I'm going to maybe set up a little heading to do with accounting issues to do with the related parties and then maybe put a little subheading to do with ethical issues to do with related parties and what you're now doing I'm not I'm not suggesting I'm not saying that you will do this but I'm suggesting this is a way of structuring your answer where there are more than one more than one uh, issue more than one issue going on there's quite a few things going on can I just check with you has everybody got the sound coming through everybody got the sound coming through everybody got the sound good okay so I actually think this is a quite a work, good way of doing it because you're saying, hey, I've identified an issue here and I know it's highlighted in the paper in the, uh, the question, but I want to show that I understand the accounting issue here. And then I want to also demonstrate the ethical issue as well. And you could do that with um, the other issues. For example, I could bring down here um, a little heading to do with fair value adjustments and I could talk about the accounting issue and then talk about the the ethical issue and what you're basically doing is you're covering off each of the issues that you see as you go through the alternative the alternative to that is to say let's let's change this let's change this and let me have one heading for the accounting issues and I'm going to go through and talk about all the different accounting issues and then after that after that, I'm going to have another uh, block of text, another block of discussion to discuss the ethical issues. And the point is, everybody, that it doesn't matter how you do it. 
But what you need to demonstrate or what you want to be able to demonstrate to your markers is that you are you're able to find a way through uh, the maze, if you like. You're able to find a way of saying, hey, this is what I identify within the, uh, the question. This is what I see as being the incorrect treatment. This is what I see as being the correct treatment. And by the way, this is now the ethical dilemma that I see. This is the ethical problem. Oh, can you hear? Can I, I must tell you this, everybody. I must tell you this. Yes, Ali, we've got an air show going on this afternoon. Um, in fact, it's been going on for it's going on for the next three days. And all of a sudden, you've heard a loud um, plane go overhead. I think it was a World War Two bomber, uh, by the way. Um, I can't see it because I'm in the studio. But anyway, that's the sound. I'm sorry about that. So, getting back to this point. It's, it's imperative that you find a way of structuring your answer. And it doesn't have to be page after page for each point. You just have to identify, show the markers that you understand what is going on, and show some of the problems that are potentially there. Now, on that basis, please, on that basis, on that basis, I want you um, to think about this. Related parties, related parties. Now, here is a situation related party transactions here is a situation where you need to demonstrate to the examiner to the markers that you understand the significance of related party transactions and that doesn't mean to say that you have to understand every single related party um, definition what is every single related party but it is important that you can say to the examiner and to the market that you understand the significance why we need the related party uh, disclosures there why do we need to have clarity why is it there are basically um, no exclusions when it comes to related party disclosures disclosures and that signifies for us please another important point is that the examiner is very keen for us to demonstrate that we do understand the significance of disclosures we've we've already seen it with is7 tell me you know why is there a, basically a, a maybe a problem with the disclosures under is7 why is it that ias1 is so important to us why is it that um, is24 is important to us why is it that we need to have rules for the definitions of an operating segment within ifrs8 and it's not it's not basically it's not saying oh and by the way prepare a fixed asset note this is not f7 but this is saying, please tell me why is it that the numbers on their own are not significant, not sufficient? Why is it that we have to have detailed disclosures about uh, credit risk, for example, under IFRS 7? It's all to do, of course, with providing the users with as much useful information as possible in order that they can make these informed economic decisions. That is really, really important. OK, so please, I want you to have a look at question two. Um, of the specimen exam paper number one and you will see some points that just jump out of the the question paper to you in terms of accounting issues to ethical issues now one other thing please is this thing called APM additional performance measures I have said to you that at this um, level of examination, interpretation and analysis is primarily based upon you understanding how the accounting standards have an impact on P&L, balance sheet, OCI, and maybe how new accounting standards can change the meaning of the statements. We also know that in, in our syllabus now, there will be um, the possibility of having to discuss additional performance measures. Um, one of the ones that is common is the EBITDA, earnings before interest tax depreciation and amortization. That, have, that is a, a very, very uh, well used additional performance measure. Now, please think about this. That has its benefits and it has its disadvantages. And it's important that you understand that company one may calculate EBITDA in completely a different way from company two. That's a possibility because, of course, EBITDA is not mandated by IFRS. So they are useful, but it's also important that we understand that they are not without their disadvantages. And remember that I'm going to give you something here, which is um, admin costs, admin over revenue, admin over revenue. Now, 
let's say times 100% as a percentage. Everybody, please, is that an additional performance measure? Is that an additional performance measure? And Kate is saying, going back to EBITDA, yes, it leads to a lack of comparability, right? That's that's what we want to be able to identify. Yes, admin over revenue, is it an EBITDA? Yes, it is, it is, because of course it is not mandated by IFRS. And I was doing some work with a company two or three years ago now, where they wanted me to help the finance team understand the significance of this. And the significance was this, they were working in a highly regulated environment. They were working in an environment where it's very, very difficult to increase the unit price of their output. And so effectively their revenue was fixed. So obviously every $1 increase in admin was having a significant impact on the profits of the business. Now that is a very, very important, a very, very important understanding, a very, very important meaning that is coming from any additional performance measure. Every company may have its own set of additional performance measures, which the analysts or the users could well find of interest and useful because of the nature of the business, because of maybe what they sell or what they do, because of their cost base. And this is what we have to understand, please. Now, to help us with that, to help us with that, let's just see if I can get back into here to help us with this please it is important please 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 that in the time that you have you go and have a look at this article on additional performance measures which is on the website for us all because you know there's a high chance that we may get a little bit of examination on it and please remember that in section b there will always be a full no sorry there will always be well, at least a part question it could be a full question on analysis and interpretation and that may include additional performance measures now remember any any interpretation and analysis question will obviously revolve around your understanding of accounting standards so in the same way that i say i don't believe you can have an ethical issue without an accounting issue i also don't believe you can have an interpretation issue without an accounting issue does that does that make sense everybody does that sort of stack up does that stack up and you know the more the more that you can go back and look at you know, maybe pass questions and reinforce your understanding, the better. Now, we're getting the end, to the end of our time together. And I said to you earlier, I'll be putting some uh, things up on Facebook uh, to assist you as, uh, as hopefully before we get to the exam, I'll certainly put up the answer to, um, to Rose. But please remember this, please remember this, please remember this. Um, it's, quite handy for you to go back and look at some P2 questions of the past. Not necessarily because you will have to prepare, for example, the full consolidation, but remember what we've done here in Jockat and, and Traveller, and, and look at what we did with Kate in Ethan and Scramble. Remember the knowledge is primarily the same. So if you were to find a situation where you could go back and look at some past exam questions and have a look at the way that they've been answered, yeah, and I will maybe suggest some of those to you. If you have a look at some of those, then you'll start to get even more familiar with what the examiner is looking for in your answers. And remember, it's all about the quality of the discussion. It's all about the quality of relevant points in whichever question you're answering. Please answer all of the four questions. Please make sure that you get those two uh, marks in the ethics question. And there are also two marks available for your interpretation question as well. It's all about demonstrating application of your great knowledge. Now, we're getting towards the time. I think of the peak of the air show, so it's going to get even more noisy here. <laughs> so everybody, I say this to you, let's keep in touch. Um, I will give to you, I know I've said to you, um, I'll give to you my other email address on Facebook as well, um, if you would prefer to contact me via that. But please, 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 please do this. Be confident. Be confident with the knowledge that you have and be confident with being able to apply that knowledge in the scenarios that you'll find in front of you. OK, I'm pretty sure that you can all you all really, really create strategic business reporters. Thank you so much for your time, everybody. And I wish you I wish you I wish you the well. Have a lovely, good weekend. Make it productive and all the best.
Thank you very much.